Uh, this morning, uh, the title of my sermon is Knowing God in Times of Trouble. Perhaps you've seen that on the outline, and today we're going to be in the Old Testament of the prophet Jeremiah. So I'm going to give you an opportunity now to turn to the, your Bibles, uh, to your copy of God's Word, whether it's a device, a phone, a tablet, whatever you may have, a copy of God's Word. We're going to be in Jeremiah chapter 9, and we're only going to be in two verses today. I believe God has so much to say in these two verses that this will be enough to hear Him today. And so I'm going to read the Scripture, I'm going to pray, and and really, we're just going to, to begin to hear what God has to say for our lives and how we live them out. Join me this morning in hearing the Word of God. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 and 24. Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Will you join me in prayer? Father, we have come in here this morning to worship you. We have come in here to hear you. There are many who have come in here this morning with brokenness. Many have come in here this morning, Father, with ills, suffering from health, Economic problems, relationship problems. And so, Father, we just want to hear you today. We want to hear what you have to tell us and not what man has to say. So I pray this morning, Lord, as we read your word and your truth is declared that everyone would hear you this morning and they would not hear me. They would know your truth and the purpose that you have for all of us. And that we would know the depth and riches and glory in Christ. And that we would have hope. And because of that hope, we give you all the honor and the glory. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. So, knowing God in times of trouble... Can we really know God? I mean, if you really think about it, who can say if they know God? I mean, God is infinite. He is, out he is outside of time and space. He's the creator. We're the created. We're finite. In the Psalms, 145.3, the psalmist says, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and His greatness is unsearchable. Yet God can be known by the revelation of His Son. Psalm 147.5, Great is our Lord, and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. So can we know God? He's beyond measure. He's unsearchable. He's the creator. We're the created. Well, listen to what Jesus said. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. John 17, 3. So, God is unsearchable. He's vast. He's infinite. But yet... God can be known, and God can be known in what He chooses to reveal, and we're going to see that today. There was this old country church, and they were having a revival, and the preacher there was preaching for three consecutive nights. Can you imagine that, going to church three nights in a row, 
hearing a, hearing a sermon from a preacher. But they were leading in their annual uh, evangelism and an annual, revi- annual revival. And so the first night, the preacher gave a message of repentance. And he encouraged the congregation to repent, turn from their sins, and turn to the Lord. It was a powerful message. And so moved was one man that he came down the aisle and with his arms lifted up high and he said, Oh Lord, fill me, fill me Lord. Well, that was the end of the service. The second night, the pastor preached another message and he encouraged the church and the congregation to live lives in obedience in response to that repentance. And so it was a powerful message. And so once again, at the end of the altar call, that same man came down the altar and said, Fill me, Lord! Fill me! And the service concluded. Night two. Third night came along. And the pastor preached a message of holiness. That the congregation, if they had repented and decided to live lives of holiness, that now was the time. And so at the end of that service in the altar call, here came that same man the third night in a row to which he exclaimed, Fill me, Lord! Fill me! And there was a voice in the back of the church that said, Don't do it, Lord! He leaks! (laughs) The truth is, is that we all leak from time to time. We all, as the prophet Isaiah said, have been like sheep led astray. We live in a world today that wants to lead you astray. And so what you need to know in the times of trouble is the most basic fact is that you need to know God. You need to know Him. You know what He believes, what He stands for, His purpose for you. And how he reveals himself. You see, in this book of Jeremiah, there is a recurring theme in the book of Jeremiah. And it was a recurring theme of the prophets. Repent. Why? Because the nation of Israel was a nation that was worshipping false idols. And over and over and over again, it was a cycle. The same thing happened in this circular pattern. The people sinned. They worshipped false idols. They repented. They came back to God. They were led astray. They worshipped false idols. God told them to repent. They did. He restored them. And the cycle came over and over and over again. And they worshipped false idols. Mute idols carved out of wood and overlaid with silver and gold. To the point where they even brought the idols into the house of God. God was offended, and rightly so. But I know what you're thinking this morning. I know what you're thinking. We don't have idols. We don't have carved images overlaid with gold and silver. You know, God comes to us and He speaks to us here in this And verse 23, and the first thing we need to know about God is to know God is to follow His instructions. The first thing that He says here is, thus says the Lord. God is speaking, not man. And He gives us these instructions. He tells us to follow His instructions with the admonition beginning there in verse 23. Look at the text. What does God say? Let not, three times, let not, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the strong man boast in his strength, and let not the rich man boast in his riches. Three things here. Wisdom, strength, money. You know... The problem was for ancient Israel is that the problem that we see for many of us today. You know, many of you feel, and rightly so, that this world has just gone upside down. Things are just not like they used to be. Or, 
Things are just not like they're supposed to be. People are led astray. And sometimes we get led astray. We need to follow God and what God is telling us to do. But he says here, he says, let not these three things, let not the wise man, the strong man, the rich man, what? What does he tell him not to do? Boast. The word boast in Hebrew would mean uh, to shine. Some of your Bibles, if it's you're reading a King James Version, is glory. Let not the man glory in him, in his strength. Why? What's the issue here? What's the, what's the implication for us? It's the possessive. Look back with me here in the Bible. Look back with me here in Jeremiah 9.23. Look what God says. He says, let not the wise man boast in what? His wisdom. His strength. His riches. Why? Let me get Dr. Phil on you for a moment. How's that working out for you? You know, we have a, a lot of things um, in this world that are good. Um, wisdom is good. Strength is good. Money is good. In fact, money is kind of important. It's like oxygen. You know, you kind of have to have it. And so, God is not saying here that these things in and of themselves are bad. What is He saying? If you're putting your trust in that... It's futile. If you're putting your trust completely in, in smarts, in wisdom, you know, there's the old saying, you know, you can buy books, but you can't buy brains. You know, money is, is good. Um, money can buy you a bed, but it can't buy you a good night's sleep. Money can buy you a house, but can't buy you a home. It can buy you medicine, but it can't guarantee you good health. And so what is happening here? This, this nation of Israel was, was putting all their hope in all these external things. But, but God, they had known God. They were God's chosen people. Delivered from the bondage of Egypt. Blessed, protected, given victory over Armies and nations that were multiple times bigger and stronger than them. Is strength bad? No, strength is a good thing if we know where strength comes from. When David slew the Goliath, a little shepherd boy, you mean to tell me that you're going to take this little boy with a slingshot and some stones and he's going to defeat a nine-foot military giant who came to him with a sword, with a spear, and a javelin? What did David come to him with? He came to him with nothing more by saying that he came in the name of the Lord. Just the name of the Lord. You know, I think sometimes that it's easy for us to get caught up in the trappings of this world that says if we can put our hope in something that we own, if we, you know, if we have enough money, we'll be able to ride out this, uh, this recession or this inflation. You know, if we just elect the right person in office, all our problems are going to go away. Or if we, we stand by a certain political party then all, we will, all those problems and things that were turned upside down. If we just come out with a, a medicine that can fix something, I'm just going to say it, we can't even cure the common cold. God knows this. The question is this morning, do you know that? And so the question God asks each of us, He knows you. Do you know Him? Do you know God? To know God is to follow God. And to follow God is His instructions. Now I know sometimes some people will say, well, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Sounds good. And I'd give you an amen on that. But do we always do that? 
Does it always settle it? It's true. But it's not that perhaps sometimes that you know it. Do you believe it? Do you believe what God is telling you? Because if it does, you make a decision. C.S. Lewis, the 20th century um, theologian said, when you make a decision, it'll turn the central part of you. When you make a decision, when you commit, when you believe. Wisdom is good, but in and of itself, depending upon it, is futile. Proverbs 3.5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And what? Lean not on your own understanding. Written by King Solomon, who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, and God spoke through him, who said, Vanity of vanities, and all is vanity. And he said also in Ecclesiastes in 118, For in much wisdom is vexation. The book of Ecclesiastes, when he was saying vanity of vanities, he's saying it's all vanity without God. Without God. To know God is to, to follow God, His instructions. God is not sitting on His throne giving out orders. He's caring for you. He's guiding you. He's loving you. And so when we read these words here in the Scriptures, God has a purpose for us because He's guiding us. He wants us to follow us and not listen to those that are telling us what we need to do to fix our problems. You know, I'm not going to take a survey this morning, but I'm going to bet there's just a few people in here that have some problems going on today in their life. And it might be money. It might be relationships. It might be health. It might be just the problems that just seem too much. We need to understand that to know God is to, to follow His instructions. But why is God coming to us here in, in this portion here in chapter 9 and, and 23 and 24? What's going on? Well, as we said here is that the nation of Israel is sinning greatly and they're causing themselves to become worship idols. But, but we don't have idols here, do we? Do we have idols today? Are there idols in our life? Are there idols in our world? Listen, an idol is whatever claims the loyalty that belongs to God. I want to say that again, and you can even write that down if you want to this morning. An idol is whatever claims the loyalty that belongs to God alone. The loyalty that belongs to God alone. In the movie Lily of the Fields, which was an older movie made decades ago, and Sidney Poitier was the lead actor in the movie, he, they were in a small town that was building a chapel for a church. And the community was coming together building this church for a group of nuns, building a small chapel. And one of the community leaders was a man that was helping out. Everybody in the town was kind of getting together on this. But he was a devout atheist. And Sidney Poitier was like, what are you doing here helping us build this church? Aren't you an atheist? To which this businessman, this atheist replied, just in case. Just in case. You know... We may not have carved idols, um, statues, um, things overlaid with gold or silver, but you know what we keep in our back pocket sometimes? Just in case. Just in case. We keep the little gods in our back pocket just in case. God just doesn't seem to work out for what we're hoping for. We keep idols tucked away. We, we hold on to certain people and places or things just to cover our backs. We keep just in case in our back pockets. Listen, God is never satisfied with partial commitment. 
when we hold on to false gods in our life, we cease to truly know who God is. As long as we keep holding on to just in case in our back pocket, we truly cease to know who God is. The next thing I want us to see this morning is that we can know God by following His attributes. It's kind of a fancy word, I'm sorry. Probably another word might be His character or His nature. What are God's attributes? What's His nature? God is love. God is spirit. God is eternal. God is forgiving. God is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He knows everything. And God is everywhere. He's omnipresent. But God lists what are His attributes here. Look with me now in verse 24. God says, But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me. Isn't that interesting that God says understands and knows? There are actually two words. Understands meaning um, to consider. Knows meaning not only to, to know, to learn, but to want to know. Do you want to know God today? Do you want to know His character? Do you want to know what His plan is for your life today? It is interesting also in this text that he says, if you're going to boast, boast in this, that you understand, that you know that God is love. God is justice. God is righteousness. That is God because of these things. But God says, are these just platitudes? Are these just philosophy? Are these just flowery things about who God is and we can just all get together and say nice things about who God is? No. Why? Because the text says here, look with me in verse 24, it says he practices these things. God is active in this world and God is active in your life despite of the world that wants to tell you And lead you astray to solve your problems. He is the God of love and justice and righteousness. Isaiah 54.8 says, God says, with everlasting love, I will have compassion on you. Says the Lord, your Redeemer. In this The love of God was made manifest among us that God sent His only Son into the world so that, listen, so that we might live through Him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5.8. I'm sorry there, I... I cited 1 John 4, 9, and 10, and I went right into Romans 5, 8. I got so excited about God's love this morning. God loves you. Meditate on that for a moment. He sent His Son for you. To die for you. What happens when we trust in those just-in-case things in our back pocket. They're not just the idols in our life. What happens is, is that when we trust in those idols in our life, we have too low a view of heaven and too high a view of earth. I'm going to say that again. When we put our trust in -in just-in-case, We have a too low a view of God and too high a view of the idols in our life. And that's the problem that ancient Israel faced. That's the same problem today. Listen, we live in a world today that listens to the pundits 
instead of the prophets. We live in a world today that listens to the politicians and not the preachers. We live in a world today that listens to the news commentators instead of the Creator. And all this happens in the world today because we view humanism over biblical truth. God has given us a record of His Word for us that we might know Him, that we might enjoy Him, that we might worship Him and serve Him for all eternity. But the most important way we know God in times of trouble is following Him through His Son, Jesus Christ. If God practices love and justice and righteousness, the question that we would have to ask then today, the all-important question is, who is love? Who is justice? Who is righteousness? Let me give you the spoiler alert on that one. His name is Jesus Christ. You know, Christianity is unlike any other faith in the world. Why? It's not an ideology. It is not a philosophy. It is only the person of Jesus Christ. Love and justice and righteousness alone is Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad to know that truth? Who is Jesus Christ? Look, turn with me for a moment to the book of Colossians. And I want to read the testimony to the church in Colossae. First, Colossians 1 verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things. And in Him, all things hold together. Listen, if you think this world is out of control, I want you to know something today. God is still sovereign. God is on His throne. And He is holding it all together through His Son, Jesus Christ. And He, verse 18, and He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him, listen, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things. Whether on earth or in heaven, making the peace by the blood of of his cross. God practices love and justice and righteousness in his son Jesus Christ. We cannot know everything exhaustively, every single detail about God, but we can know what God has revealed to us through his son Jesus Christ. I love the book of Hebrews because Hebrews is that bridge, that connecting bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Listen what it testifies to Christ in Hebrews 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, as we read earlier in Jeremiah. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. And He upholds the universe by the word of His power. Jesus Christ, by the word of His power, holds 
all things together. So we can know God by following God, by His instructions, by knowing His character, His nature. But those things are revealed in the practices and the nature of His Son, Jesus Christ. And in the last verse there of 24, Jeremiah, God said, For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. You know, if God delights in something, we should delight. Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Not something that you can run down and get at the station, at the Walmart station, or uh, the car lot, or the jewelry store, or the bank. He says that He can give you the desires of your heart when you delight in the Lord. God delights in love and justice and righteousness, whom is His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, Whoever has my commands and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. God will make himself known to us through his Son, Jesus Christ. John 14, 21. Micah 6, 8. Mankind, he has told you what is good and what it is the Lord requires of you to act justly, to love faithfulness, and walk humbly with your God. We can know God. We need to know God in times of trouble. We need to know that knowing God is following God by what God has told us in His Word, by instructions, by His character, by His nature, and through the revelation of His Son, Jesus Christ, whom is ultimate and supreme love, justice, and righteousness. The gospel should remind us, moment by moment, that we are in need of grace and that we cannot do anything apart from Christ. It should drive us to prayer each and every day. It should drive us to daily fellowship with God. It should humble us even when in an argument. It should cause us to serve others rather than seek to be served. The gospel, in short, should remind us that it is the most practical things that we can do and what Christ has done for us on the cross. There's great encouragement for us to love and worship God due to the fact that God wants you in a special relationship with His Son. The Bible even says that He wants you to be His friend in John 15. We know God by following Him when we live out our faith in Christ. That's what knowing God means. In a world today that has been turned upside down, in a world that says wrong is right and right is wrong, from Isaiah 5. We live in a world today that is not like it used to be, and it is not the way it is supposed to be. Because sin has entered the world. But God has provided that provision for us and the solution by His Son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. We have to come to Him in simple, childlike faith by repenting of our sins, confessing Him as Lord, and making a decision to commit our lives to Him. I want to give you three things today as we conclude our service this morning. As I said when, at the beginning of this sermon, that many of you have walked in today with problems. Listen, don't tell God how big your problem is. Tell your problem how big God is. I want you today to look at the strongest idol in your life, the just in case in light of what you could lose in clinging to it rather than to God? What could you lose by clinging to it rather than God? 
And then for one day, I want to encourage you this week. I want you to carve out one day and stop every hour, just once an hour, and evaluate your life and find out what has mastered your life for that one hour. What is your just-in-case for that one hour? Do it. Maybe it'll be revealed to you. Maybe you won't find out. Ask God to reveal that to you. Ask God what's the just-in-case that you're holding in your back pocket. And know God by following God, by what He has told us, by His character, and through only, supremely, His Son, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, I thank You for the power. I thank You for the truth of Your Word this morning. That You are a God who thus says, because You are a God who speaks. I pray, Father, that You have spoken to our hearts in such a powerful way, Lord, that we will respond to You in a way that we do not trust the things that are just in case in our back pockets. That we will trust You greater. That we will lean upon our faith greater upon You each and every day. That we will come to know You, enjoy You, worship You, and serve You for all eternity. That You would be glorified. In the powerful name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.